Hello and welcome. My name is Chris Cant with Harbour Insight and with me I have Andrew Pankerthman, Chief Executive of Ardea Resources. Ardea is working on its Kalgoorlie Nickel project and the DFS2 be coming out later on this year um, with its JV partners Sumitomo and Mitsubishi. This is one of a series of conversations that we're having with Andrew and today we really want to get into the nickel market and understanding what kind of environment the Kalgoorlie Nickel Project will be delivering its product into. Welcome, Andrew. Great to be here. Thanks, Chris. Um, our research indicates that investors are very much you know, looking at natural resource equities for exposure to the energy transition. Nickel is obviously a, a key part of that. Um, what's, your, what's your feeling about what's happening in the market at the moment? Obviously, you're talking to investors on a regular basis. What's the feeling out there in terms of investors that want that kind of exposure and where nickel sits in the mix of battery minerals and, and energy transition um, leverage? Yeah, great question, Chris. And uh, I guess to set the scene, um, nickel is classified as a critical mineral in Australia, Japan, US and Canada, you know, in line with all of our key allies. And if we look at that demand for, for nickel, obviously we've got traditional uses such as stainless steel that, that are going to contend, continue with a strong compound annual growth rate. And then in more recent times, so we've seen the rapidly increasing demand around the energy transition in, in particular for lithium ion batteries, electric vehicles and large scale energy storage. So firstly, the the fundamentals and, and the growth for nickel are uh, assured. Um, in terms of supply, we have seen um, a rapid increase in production in recent years, particularly out of Indonesia. You know, they, they are now the, the largest producer of nickel. Um, however, you know, we've got key considerations around supply chain security, diversity of supply, security of supply chains. And we think with that, that background, the development of the Kalgoorlie nickel project is essential. And in terms of our pathway to production, you know, the earliest we could be in production is 2029, 2030, and we're determining that price, precise timing as part of the in-progress definitive feasibility study. Um, but certainly all the independent forecasts I see from, you know, the the independent experts, whether it be Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, CRU, Woodmac, et, et cetera. You know, we think our timing to production is exceptional and particularly given the large scale and long life of this project, we've got a 40 year oil reserve that's only assessing six or nine deposits. So in reality, we expect this project for, to be operating for 50, 60 years. Um, so it will have the ability to operate through mo multiple cycles within the nickel commodity price cycle. And we, we think our timing to production is incredibly well placed with um, most of the research I'm seeing, expecting the nickel market to flip back into deficit from about 2030 onwards and also to see a corresponding increase in both the nickel and cobalt price. Okay. Um, I wanted to get into a bit more detail um, on some of that supply side uh, dynamic in a little while, but just in terms of what's happening right now, um, before we get into that longer term scenario on the real fundamental drivers of nickel, um, can you give us a bit of a feel for what's happening in the market? Obviously it's a small market, there's volatility. What are you seeing at the moment? What are you hearing? And what does it look like in terms of maybe the next, we can talk about the six to 12 months? Yep. No, sure. So look, currently the nickel price is about $15,000 US a ton. On a historic average, that's a, a fair price, but um, in terms of you know the the cost of doing business, well, we're we're seeing that increase right right around the world, and the intel that I'm I'm receiving is that the the rate at which nickel production has expanded in Indonesia is unsustainable. Um, mining economics 101, you, you're going to access your highest value ore first. Um, there's not an infinite supply of nickel resources in Indonesia nor around the world. So there, 
mineral resources and oil reserves are progressively being depleted. Certainly the intel I'm receiving is that there will be a rapid depletion at their mineral resources and oil reserves. And um, after the next five to 10 years, um, we think our, our timing is just perfect to come into production. Okay. When you're talking about rapid depletion there, um, are we, are we likely to see the effects of that in the, in the near term? Obviously it's going to increase in severity as time progresses, but are we at a, a bit of an inflection point? And I'll, I'll stop short of asking you to predict prices or anything yeah. like that, Andrew, but, um, is this effect that you're talking about, is that something we're, we're going to see in market dynamics relatively soon? Look, I, I very much believe it, it will be, it, it'll be more of a gradual transition, but, um, similarly that the cost of doing business around the world's continuing to increase regardless of what jurisdiction you're, you're based in, um, existing operations, you know, increasing will require more working capital. Um, a lot of the nickel production from some jurisdictions overseas doesn't meet the high ESG expectations of, you know, countries like Australia, Japan, Korea, the United States, United Kingdom, you know, essentially Australia and, and our key allies. So if we were in production today, you know, I'm, I'm being told by potential offtake partners that, well, our production would be sought after in preference to most other production around the world because of our very high expected ESG standards that are in line with being a Western Australian based nickel cobalt producer and, and meeting the the requirements, but also the, the plans we have in place for making sure that our nickel cobalt supply does meet the highest standards. So our production is always going to be in demand and, um, the future outlook for both nickel and cobalt is being incredibly robust. As you point out the Kalgoorlie nickel project mine life, the initial mine life, that's before you look at any kind of growth opportunities and increase in reserves and resources is 40 years very long-term project. When you're looking at that, uh, demand scenario kind of out on those horizons, obviously very difficult to, to get a, a real fix on things. What, what are the, what's the window of tolerance and what are the things that are, um, the, uh, the variables that, uh, that may or may not happen that could shift demand, you know, to the top end of that window or towards the bottom. Is it just about EVs and, and storage or what are the other things that people should be looking at if they're trying to get a feel for that market? Yeah, I think increasingly nickel's used in a broad range of applications. So we expect everyone's got a smartphone these days that there's nickel and, um, those uses, you know, from a technological perspective are going to continue to increase and, and then running in parallel with that, you know, we've got compound annual growth rate of several percent for traditional uses such as stainless steel. And there's no doubt that the world's going to continue to expand. You know, we, we've seen most recently the rapid expansion in China. You know, there's been a lot of discussion now for at least the last decade on the growing role India will play. Um, you know, we, we're, we're seeing the population to continue to expand the, the demands on new infrastructure, new technology and raising the overall standard of living for the entire nation. It's, it's going to continue to ensure that we have that demand and even, you know, um, countries like Australia, you know, where our population continues to expand as well. So I think the the outlook for nickel and cobalt has yeah, ne never been brighter. And you have mentioned the, um, the ESG or the su uh, supply chain security dynamics. Can we go into a little bit more detail around that and looking at obviously a critical mineral, but where the supply chains are, are directed globally, the sources of supply. Um, and when you're talking to, uh, potential off takers down who are looking at the product down the track, how important is that ESG element to them? Do they feel a lot of pressure when it comes to making sure that they've got responsible supply? We saw a lot of supply chain shocks around COVID and I think there was a big wake up call for the entire world. And fortunately we've seen that tend to rebalance, but, um, yeah, governments right around the world are very much focused on reliable, secure supply chains and Australia's working incredibly closely with its 
key allies to ensure that continues. So I think we've got incredible support within Australia, Japan, but also other key ally nations to see the Kalgoorlie Nickel Project developed. And there's already a, a great deal of interest in securing offtake from our project. And that could be both directly from the mine gate or, or similarly with um, you know, the expectation of Sumitomo and Weddell Mining um, processing a fair amount of that material in their existing refineries and key uh, nickel supply chain infrastructure in Japan. But, but then seeing that product go to key ally nations as well, and whether that be um, the United States, the, the EU, etc. So we're, we're seeing increased focus from Australia and all our key allies. And all of those jurisdictions are very much focused on ESG. It, it is an incredibly important consideration. And whilst I can't ever talk for our joint venture partners, I, I you know, it, it's quite obvious, you know, it's a key consideration for them. And, um, you know, one of the key factors for wanting to partner with us in the Kalgoorlie Nickel Project, both from a uh, technical perspective and the, the quality of the resource, but, but similarly also with the high ESG standards that we expect from the project. Andrew, that's all we've got time for, but thanks for joining us. Uh, excellent catch up. Thanks, Chris.